Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Terry Meyerson. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's great to be back together to talk about the next generation of Windows, Windows 10. It's great to see some familiar faces, some new faces, and welcome the many, many more that are joining via webcast today, particularly our Windows insiders. This is the second of several Windows 10 conversations we're planning to have with you, and we've got a lot to share over the next two hours. We're hoping to cover three things. The first, how the feedback we've received, received since introducing Windows 10 is truly helping to shape the future of Windows 10. And then, we will share the most comprehensive view yet of new experiences coming to Windows 10. You'll see Cortana like never before. You'll see entirely new ways of being productive and having fun. And you'll see some amazing new devices enabled by Windows 10. And then Satya will join us to discuss Windows and its importance to Microsoft. Now, we introduced Windows 10 that last September. Let me recap the key points from that discussion. First and foremost, Windows 10 will provide a seamless transition for our Windows 7 and Windows 8 customers, including the familiar desktop and start menu. And Windows 10 will be our best enterprise platform ever, enabling our enterprise customers to be more productive than ever before, simplifying management and deployment for IT, and working seamlessly with existing enterprise apps. But most importantly, Windows 10 will protect corporate data better than ever. In fact, the hardware-based security of Windows 10 would have countered the te techniques used in several of the recent headline-making attacks. And Windows 10 will support the broadest device family ever. Of course, it will work great on the laptop and the desktop. The most productive devices on the planet with keyboard, mouse, and touch. Our hardware partners are doing amazing work in this area, introducing several new designs at CES, thinner and lighter, with amazing screens. The Windows 10 Continuum experience enables these incredible two-in-one devices that switch back and forth between the keyboard mouse mode and the touch tablet mode. Windows 10 on tablets, phablets, and phones will provide the best mobile experience for our Windows and Xbox users. With Windows 10, universal Windows apps come to Xbox One, the most fun game console ever. And Windows 10 has support for today's maker boards, enabling makers to do incredible things with Windows in the fast-growing Internet of Things space. Windows 10 is the only platform that enables innovation across this broad family of devices. Developers can target all of these device types with one platform and one store. And stay tuned until later today as our device family expands. Now, since September, we have received a lot of feedback from customers, partners, and press. But the most important feedback has come from our Windows Insider program. We're humbled that 1.7 million have signed up to shape Windows 10 with us. They've installed Windows 10 over 3 million times on a broad spectrum of PCs. This is a testament, I think, to not only the quality of Windows 10 this early, but the commitment these insiders are showing to the program. Collectively, these insiders have shared with us over 800,000 pieces of feedback on over 200,000 topics. And our team is really embracing this feedback and leaning in to this new open development process. And I wanted to let you hear directly from the engineers on the team. The Windows Insider program is a global program. It provides essential feedback directly to Microsoft and directly to the hands of the PMs and developers building the product. We went through the effort to ask questions and give our engineers the capability to get your feedback 
because we want to make the best possible product that we can for you. It will result in a better global product for Windows. Windows insiders are hugely important to us. We love you guys. We see our relationship with insiders as a partnership where we work together to build the best Windows 10 possible. You know there are 1.5 billion people in the world who use Windows. When we get your feedback, it makes it easier for us to make sure the product matches your expectations. So thank you. We really appreciate the fact that you are giving time out to give us feedback and to help make a difference in Windows, and we are truly appreciative of that. This feedback that you send through the Windows feedback applications gets sent to a Microsoft data center, and then we process this into something that's intelligible for engineers. This appears on various dashboards that engineers can use, all the way up to our VPs. They're looking at this on a daily basis, and they hold us accountable. This is really the future of building Windows. We're doing it together. We're getting feedback from 226 different geographies around the world. And we owe it to you to read each one of those comments that you give us and to take actions on it. We know how much time and dedication you are giving us. Without you, we wouldn't be where we are today. When we started Windows 10, we had a vision of having our window switcher, so Alt-Tab and Task View. And one of the pieces of feedback we received was people love that, but they thought Alt-Tab was a little too jarring. And so we made a change based on your feedback to make Alt-Tab a little more familiar, but still retain all those benefits. There actually is a real translation between feedback that's given and impact or changes that we're making in the product. We're listening. Thank you for all you have done so far, and um, we will definitely repay your investment with a great release. You're showing us your commitment to Windows. We want you to know that we're committed to you. There simply isn't a path forward for Windows without a direct connection with the customer. The Windows Insider program gives us that connection at an earlier phase than at any other time in the history of Windows. We're co-creating the future of Windows with you. One of the beautiful things about this program is that I kind of feel connected to people in Tokyo who love Windows just as much as I do. This is not just a Redmond thing, this is a global thing. So wherever you are, it's our Windows. To all the insiders tuned in today, a special thank you from everyone on the team. Your feedback and your time are really helping to shape the future of Windows. And if you have not joined, now is the time. Please go to windows.com and sign up for free. So now, I want to take you back to when we were envisioning Windows 10. Windows has always been grounded in the idea that technology should help individuals and organizations do great things. At that time, we identified three areas that were ripe for innovation and improving our customers' lives. We think of these areas, three areas, as moving windows from our heritage of enabling a single device to what we're calling more personal computing. The first of these areas was mobility of experience. The number of smart devices that families, ourselves, or in the workplace is just exploding all around us. It should be easy to put one device down and pick another up, pick another, and continue where you left off. The technology needs to get out of the way and provide mobility of the experience. The second area was trust. In our connected world, we know that people care about their privacy, and so do we. So everything we do puts the customer in control, because you are our customer, not our product. And the third, natural interactions. Interacting with technology should be as natural as in interacting with people. Voice, pen, gest gestures, and your gaze should help you get more out of your devices in an additive and intuitive way. The right interaction in the right way at the right time. So I want to share with you two cinemagraphs we created back then during the earliest days of Windows 10. Before we wrote a line of code, we wanted the team to be visualizing the world in which Windows 10 would live and how Windows 10 would add value for our customers. These cinemagraphs inspired us and got us dreaming about more personal computing. First, we envision the workplace. There's that explosion of devices, many running Windows, some not. 
And while these individual devices offer value, they struggle to work well together. The apps are different. The content is hard to move around between my devices. And not only my devices, but those of my colleagues and the company. Every meeting starts with a dance about how to project, or ends with this discussion about how do we get meeting notes out or the whiteboard out to everyone involved. The mobility of the experience just isn't there. You should be able to print with a flick or transfer a Skype call with a simple, natural, and intuitive gesture. And businesses need to trust that their corporate data is protected and managed as it moves between all of these devices. We were inspired to bring more personal computing to the workplace. And then at home, we had that same explosion of smart devices. PCs, phones, tablets, game consoles, smart appliances, and innovative new devices like wearables. Whether doing homework or playing a great game, the opportunity is there to make an experience that is more mobile across the devices. We see a world where you can share that experience across all the devices, using ink, voice, gestures, and gaze, making technology really come to life. And with devices being brought home from work, and younger and younger kids having their own devices, it's important that our customers' privacy is respected, and they trust the devices and the experience. We were inspired to bring more personal computing to the home and the workplace to enable our customers to do great things. Now to do this, we need our work in the hands of our customers. But not just our work, but the great work being done by Windows developers. We all know that developers are always looking for their next customer their next million customers. And we're going to help them find their next billion customers with Windows 10. Now today, Windows customers are spread across many versions. Limitation makes it challenging. To delight our, cust delight our customers with applications. So we have been investing heavily and making our upgrades as seamlessly as possible for our customers to create a large, up-to-date customer base for developers. We have helped almost 200 million consumers to the latest update of, this update of Windows 8.1. And we have helped over 650 million, 50 million consumers upgrade seamlessly to Windows 7 SP1. For each, for each of these customers, the security of their system improved. They received new capabilities and features, making them to play new, to play new games, enabling them to do more. But the engineering work to enable a seamless upgrade is only the first part. So I'm, so I'm very excited to announce that for the first year after Windows 10 is available, we will be making available a free upgrade to Windows 10 to all devices running Windows 8.1. And we will also be making available a free upgrade to Windows 10 to all devices running Windows Phone 8.1. And last but not least, for the first year after Windows 10 is available, we will be making available a free upgrade to all of our customers still running Windows 7. <laughs> now, this is so much more, though, than a free one-time upgrade. Once a device is upgraded to Windows 10, we will be keeping it current for the supported life of the device, keeping it secure, introducing new features and functionality to our customers over, customers over time, 
In fact, with Windows 10, we think of Windows as a service. In the next couple of years, one could reasonably think of Windows as one of the largest internet services on the planet. And just like other internet services, the question, what version are you running, will cease to make sense. This is great for our Windows developers. Not only can they target all device types with one application, PCs, phones, tablets, Xbox, the Internet of Things, but now they can target every single Windows device. Windows as a service makes Windows 10 the most attractive Windows development platform ever. And what about the enterprise? We will continue to support the way Windows works today with long-term branches and long-term support. However, the best practice for most enterprises and certainly all daily productivity devices that our customers use will be to directly connect those devices to Windows Update so those devices receive the best security and the best productivity functionality over time as soon as they are available. When you take back and consider the, con the implications of Windows as a service, today really is a monumental day for Windows. Windows as a service is great for consumers. It's great for developers. And it's great for the security of our enterprise customers. Windows 10 is so much more than the latest version of Windows. Windows 10 changes the rules of the game and redefines the relationship between us and our customers. So by now, I'm sure you want to see Windows 10 devices and experiences in action. So I'm going to invite up four of our leaders to show you more of Windows 10. First, Joe Belfiore will join us to show you the most productive Windows 10 experiences ever on PCs, 2-in-1s, and, ta and, and tablets. And for the first time, Windows 10 on a phone. Then Phil Spencer will join us to discuss gaming on Windows 10. And then Hyatt Gallo and Alex Kitman will join us to discuss two entirely new Windows experiences. So please join me in welcoming Joe B. Good morning. Uh, hi there, I'm Joe Belfiore, and I manage a part of Terry's team that's focused on PCs, tablets, and phones. And I'm excited to be here today with all of you to give you a first look at Windows 10 and how we've updated across that wide range of devices. He kind of gave an intro already, so are you all ready? Would you like to see a demo? Yes, demo, yeah, all right. Let's uh, come right over here. And the first thing I want to do is recap some of the work that we've done on the core experience in the PC since we first announced Windows 10 back in September and started up our Insider program. So you can see here I've got my demo machine set up. The taskbar is a little more streamlined here. We have our search box that we added throughout the, as we were going along the Insider program. I'll open up the Start menu. You'll see the visuals have evolved a little bit there. And one of the features that people have asked about a lot, we now have in our builds. That's the ability to take the Start menu full screen. So all those people with touch devices or that are comfortable with and like the Windows 8 style of UI for the Start menu now have a customization option that lets them use it, the PC the way they would like. And of course, I can go right back here and put it back to its small mode, which is familiar to those people coming from Windows 7. Now, another of the areas that our insiders asked about and that there were a bunch of questions around was, how are we going to deal with the touch gestures? And how is the charms bar going to evolve? And I want to show you here, when I pan in from the right, we now bring up our updated action center. And the Action Center is the place where you can do quick actions, like down here on the bottom, I can expand these quick action buttons, and you'll see I have things like a fast way to turn on or off airplane mode. Up above, we have notifications.
notifications. And these are coming from all the apps that you have installed on your system. And one of the cool new things in this build, um, I can expand these notifications here. And you'll see that applications can add in things like buttons or images or edit controls. So as notifications appear, you can interact directly with the app in a way that the software developer designs up front. Now, one last thing I want to show here in this sort of core experience evolution is how we're evolving our settings experience. So uh, I'm going to go right here and touch all settings. We've heard our insiders say that they'd like us to fix up the confusion between the control panel and the settings in Windows 8. So we're going to bring those things together in one UI that will be familiar to people coming from Windows 7 and uh, handy for people used to Windows 8. So that's the core, sort of the core shell. The other thing that we really talked about in September that's very important to Windows 10 is the Continuum feature. And Continuum is about enabling a two-in-one device like this, which I've been using like a laptop, to transform elegantly into sort of a tablet form factor. So let me uh, restore some windows here. And you'll see I've got a bunch of windows open in various positions on the screen. Uh, I can move those around, use my mouse and keyboard. But when I remove the mouse and keyboard, you'll see we get a little pop-up here. Do you want to enter tablet mode? I'll choose that, and now my windows are full screen. And I can use this in a very natural way like a tablet. I can left swipe in to get task switching and then switch between full screen apps. If I touch the start button there, you'll see it's now automatically the full screen start menu, which I can use touch gestures to navigate around. And then, when I'm done using it like a tablet, I snap the keyboard back in, I get a prompt, I can exit tablet mode, and now I'm right back to where I was, able to use it like a PC with windows that are restored, the start menu back in its small size. And the whole point is, a device like this elegantly transforms from one mode to another. And it's happening in a natural way without the UI being something that's confusing to people. And one of the things that we haven't really spent a lot of time showing is how that continuum experience enables great new PC form factors to feel really natural, like this 8-inch tablet. So here on the 8-inch tablet, which is running that same version of Windows, I'm going to use it like a tablet in this normal way. I can do those same edge swipes you saw. I can use my finger to do things like close app. So I'll pull that app down to close it. And, and one of the things that insiders have asked about, is this going to work with Win32 apps the same way? Well, absolutely. I can deal with all my apps, whether they're written to the modern platform or the Win32 platform, in a consistent way and use this device like a tablet. Now, the other thing that I can do here, uh, I can switch between apps. I'll pan in from the left. I'll go to my sports app. But this tablet device, of course, running all the capable features of Windows, is a highly powerful kind of thing. I can use touch gestures to move an app over here to the side. And I'm going to do some sports and health and fitness at the same time. I can tie all these apps. Then I can use touch to move the midpoint. And then, of course, because this is running a full version of PC, a full version of Windows, it's a full PC. If I exit that tablet mode, I've got regular Windows with my full taskbar right down here on the on the bottom, entirely familiar to anyone using a full PC. And you can imagine a small device like this getting docked to a keyboard and mouse and a large screen and for someone who's a mobile task worker, it works like a tablet while you're out and about, and then it works exactly like a PC when you bring it back and dock it. Thank you, Holly. So that gives you a sense of how the work that we talked about back in September and these core features has evolved since we've done those builds and how that core experience of Windows really elegantly enables a wide range of device form factors to work naturally the way people will expect in a UI that's familiar to whichever mode of the device they're in. OK, so that's the part where I want to recap stuff that we've already talked about. From here on out, it's all new. And before I jump into some new demos, I want to point out to all of you in the room and to our insiders on screen, I'm going to be showing you builds that are not finished. Um, and so there's a bit of risk in this demo. And in the interest of having our insiders and all of you with us throughout the development process, we're going to see some glitches. But it's our psychology now to involve people in that development process. Um, and I know you're all curious to see. So, these features will be coming. I'm going to show you a range of features. They'll be coming over the next three, four, five months at varied points of time in our insider builds. And you're going to get to see where they're at today. 
Okay? So for the first new feature I'm going to show, I need a little help. Uh, uh, I know she's here somewhere. Luckily, I can simply summon to the stage, hey, Cortana. Hey, Joe. What have you been up to lately? Well, this morning I set a reminder for you. Lovely. You too? It seems like everyone's in on that. Anything that doesn't involve my hair? I correctly predicted most of the World Cup games. Yes, we know you're very smart. You have the Bing engine scouring the internet and learning everything about everything. You can make predictions. If you really want to show off, though, who's your pick for the Super Bowl? For you, Joe, Hawks by 78 and a half. Exactly. You know, I heard you've been telling other people something different than that. I guess this proves you really are a personal digital assistant just for me. Um, I know you've been really busy. You've been getting yourself landed on the Microsoft Band. You've been traveling to lots of new places. How do you like meeting people in all these other countries? I love it. It's fantastic. Fantastic. Fantastico. Jolly good. Very nice. I imagine those phrases are coming in handy in all these countries that you're now in. Um, I understand you've learned a few languages, too. Seven, actually. But my favorite new thing are impersonations. When 900 years old you reach, look as good. You will not. Yeah, I, I expect not. It sounds like you've been practicing that one a little bit. Any other big news? Do you mean like... Hey, that's not news yet. Just so you know, I didn't say anything. Yeah, I wasn't suspecting you. You didn't need to with all these folks on the job. So it's official? Let's you and I make it official right now. Cortana, we're excited to welcome you to the PC. All right. So would you folks like to see how we're going to change the PC user experience by adding in a new natural interaction with Cortana running on real builds? Yes, you're all busy typing. OK, let's switch over here to a demo machine, and I'm going to show you Cortana running on the PC. And I want you to keep in mind, early builds, early builds. Now, you'll notice here in the, in the builds that we're working on that our insiders will get a chance to try, down here on the taskbar, you'll see Cortana has a home. And that's because you could go there to click and type, but it's also a place where Cortana will occasionally pop up notifications and useful information. Because after all, she's personal, and she knows things about you, and she's there to be helpful. Now, Remember Terry mentioned we're really trying to develop the natural interaction for all these devices. So of course, we can talk to Cortana too. Hey Cortana, how does it feel to be on a PC? Feeling groovy. I'm glad you are, Cortana. And you know, you all probably are aware that Cortana lives in the cloud. She's been on Windows Phone for a while. And there's lots of things she can do that are helpful in terms of just answering quick questions. Hey, Cortana, will I need a coat tomorrow? You could probably go without one. The forecast for tomorrow shows rain with a high of 50 and a low of 48. Exactly. And as an entity that's built in the cloud based on Bing and learning all these things about the internet, Cortana keeps getting smarter and smarter over time on whatever device she's on. So she's learned lots of interesting facts that you can now ask questions about. Um, here's one with a little bit of relevance. Hey, Cortana. How much will it cost the cost to attend the University of Washington? Twelve thousand three hundred and ninety-four U.S. dollars in 2015. Exactly. So a lot of you are already familiar with Cortana, and one of the key premises of Cortana is that she's a personal digital assistant who gets to know things about you as you use your PC on whatever device you're using. And one of the important characteristics for us in designing this Cortana experience was to make sure that she felt like a trusted assistant and that anything she knew about you was transparent and available for you to manage. And Cortana is even aware of that fact herself. Hey, Cortana, what do you know about me? Well, I have my notebook, 
So I know what you know, know what you know you've let me know, you know? Yes, exactly. She knows what I've let her know about me. And people can go into the notebook, the notebook, to see what Cortana knows about them. So here's my notebook, and you see I like getting a daily glance uh, of my routine each morning. I track some stocks. I care about lots of sports news, um, and so on and so on and so on. And anytime I can add new interests to Cortana's notebook manually, if I'd like, I can remember if she's learned them incorrectly or if I simply don't want her to know those things. And those interests make her not just when she answers, she answers questions, but also when she information. And whenever you click here to engage with Cortana, the Cortana homepage, Cortana homepage shows up, and you'll see helpful things that she's providing to you proactively. You can see here she's flight that my wife is going to be on tonight. Here's some stock information, sports news. Obviously, I'm interested. I'm interested in news about the Super Bowl, and so on, and so on, and so on. Cortana's homepage experience right there, and she, that's available whenever I available whenever I click to type. I know a lot of you have tried Cortana on the phone, and when we brought Cortana to the PC, we didn't want to just take only the phone experience and put it on the PC. We wanted to educate Cortana about PC kinds of things so that she would be uniquely useful on the PC device. So there's lots of things that we're teaching her to be able to do that are helpful on the PC. Hey, Cortana, show me PowerPoint slides about the charity auction. There we go. Cortana, part of the Cortana experience is a search capability that can look on your local hard drive, in your OneDrive, and even on your OneDrive for business to aggregate together documents that you might want to be able to find through natural queries, whether you're speaking them or typing them. And that's interesting for business use cases, but it's interesting sort of for personal use cases too. Hey, Cortana, show me photos from December. She understands all these data types, and like I said, she's looking at lots of different locations to pull that data together for you in a really natural way. Uh, another thing that we tried to do was to make sure that uh, Cortana, everything I've done so far has been via, via, via speech, but we know that lots of users, in particular a lot of Windows 7 users, are accustomed to typing today a limited range of commands into their PC. But now Cortana provides a very rich capability for typing commands into your PC. And we needed to tune this so this would work correctly for the muscle memory of all those Windows 7 users out there. So I can type any of those queries I've talked about so far, but also when I do things like type in the name of an app, Cortana is smart enough to filter her, the choices that she can do for you as you're typing, and then give you the most likely thing that you would want at the press of a return. So here I've typed in part of the word Skype. Cortana recognizes I probably want to launch the Skype app on my PC, but you'll see here as well, she understands all the apps in the store. So this is a way for her to help you find new useful functionality, which are apps in the store. She provides me a quick link to a website, I could jump to Skype.com, and a bunch of candidate web searches that I might do to get helpful information about Skype. Sometimes you'll see settings in there. It's a wide range of things that are all tuned for the PC use case, and you all can try that out when you get a chance to play around with the build. Now, another thing that we wanted to do is to think about the PC, sort of, the PC sort of as an object in a home or an office. And and suddenly, having Cortana on your PC is almost like having Emily sitting around able to help you get things done. At my house, we have an all-in-one PC on a desk that's kind of at the corner of the kitchen and the family room. And with Cortana, now it's like there's someone there who I can ask to do things without changing where I am in the kitchen or the family room. Hey, Cortana, play my music. Queuing up your music. You can imagine the family dynamic now when you got this extra member of the family right there ready to tell you facts about the world or play your music or get things done. Luckily, you can say things like, hey Cortana, please be quiet. Pause. I'll show you with Cortana on the PC. And that is, uh, I want you to think about how having a speech interaction model that's rich and complete and natural in a way that we think people will really use the PC changes your ability to multitask and be effective and get things done. So I want you to imagine, uh, 
imagine I'm a financial analyst or a, uh, an accountant, and I'm working in a giant spreadsheet. And I'm one of these people, I've got like three screens filled with Excel cells, and I'm doing my formulas, I'm busy at work, and it occurs to me, oh, I wanted to get a reminder, I wanted to send somebody an email. Well, now I have a personal assistant right there with me whenever I'm using the PC, to, I can ask her to do things on my behalf. So here I am in my spreadsheet, I want to remember to send an email. I can just say, hey Cortana, send an email to Terry Meyerson. What's your email about? A very big moment. What do you want to say? This is Cortana's first email from a PC, comma, congratulations, exclamation point. Email Terry Meyerson about a very big moment. Saying this is Cortana's first email from a PC, congratulations. Send it, add more, or make changes. Send it. I've sent it. Great. We'll have Terry forward that onto the team. Hopefully you get a sense that Cortana on the PC really will provide a new natural way for people to interact with these PC devices, whether they're small light form factors you're carrying around or an all-in-one that's in a room of your home or office. Um, it is the world's most personal digital assistant, and now it's going to be available to millions and millions of people who will all have a chance to get to know Cortana and will continue making her smarter and more capable as time goes on. She has an integrated search capability that makes her able to do uniquely PC kinds of tasks, like finding files and finding photos. And what you saw here is the current state of our, here is the current state of our builds. We will be rolling out to insiders for us to work on and tune over the next several months, um, including getting to various countries as we, countries as we ramp up. To, that is Cortana on the PC. Next. I'm going to change gears and talk a little bit about some devices that we haven't shown yet. I want to focus now on phones and small tablets. Um, now, as you've seen in a bunch of our presentations, and as Terry mentioned, Windows 10 is designed for a wide range of devices, a very wide range. But what we're doing is tailoring it to be appropriate in its user experience for certain form factors. And what you've seen so far is the tailored version of Windows 10 for devices that are eight inches and above. So that's laptops, desktops, two-in-ones, and even the eight-inch tablet that you saw me bring out on stage before. What I'm gonna show you now is the Windows 10 version that's tailored for devices that are smaller than eight inches. So think about small tablets and a wide range of phones at all, size, at all sizes. I'm gonna show you a build that we are working on now to roll out to insiders in a little while. It is a little rough. Again, we're gonna be looking at code that's being developed, but let me show you what the experience is like <clears throat> when we have Windows 10 on a phone or small tablet. So uh, what I have here is a Lumia 1520. Let me see if I can pull myself out here a little farther. This is a Lumia 1520 running a recent build of Windows 10. And I'm going to show you, first I'm going to focus just on the core experience and give you a sense of how it aligns with the PC, how it'll be a great companion to the PC. So let me unlock. And the first thing you'll notice, the start experience is quite familiar to people who've been using Windows Phone in the past. But if you look there, you can see in the background, I've got a full bleed customized background image, a nice personalization feature that a lot of our users have been asking for. If I pan over to the right, you'll see we've promoted the recently installed apps right to the top of the app list. So they're really easy to find when you're installing and using apps. So another nice uh, feature that we've been getting lots of requests for. Uh, I want to show you the Action Center, which has added some new features and is now synced up with the PC. I can do things like dismiss single items that are shown here as notifications. I can now expand the action buttons just like you saw on the PC. So I get a completely consistent and familiar experience going from one device to another. Um, I also want to give you a quick look at the settings experience here, which again, we've implemented as a universal app to be the same across the PC small tablets, tablets, and phones. It's a little more organized and easier for people to find things, something we've been getting a lot of requests for from people. Oh, look at this. I'm getting a text right in the middle of my demo. That can't be a coincidence, can it? Um, so I also wanted to give you a quick look at how we're evolving input and messaging, which we view as part of the core experience of phones. 
So uh, here I'm getting this text from Marcus. When is Cortana going to send her first email to the team? Well, she did that already. You guys saw that. Now I'm going to reply. And of course, I think you all are familiar with the WordFlow keyboard on Windows Phone today, which is terrific. It has built-in shape writing. It learns about the things that you type. Um, we've made some improvements there. I'm just going to give you a quick look here on this large screen phone. I can pull the keyboard right over to the right and then do my shape writing with one hand. So that's kind of cool. But I'm not going to do that right now because the theme for today is this natural interaction and lighting these devices up with natural interaction like speech. You'll notice as well, right there above the keyboard, there's now a microphone button. So anywhere I can type, I can now talk to reply or, or put text into the phone, which is a super handy thing to be able to do throughout the phone. I sent it to Terry Meyerson, and he's going to forward it. Hashtag, let the good times roll. So there you see, I talked to my phone. Surprise, surprise. My text was recognized, but notice some of the details. I said Terry Meyerson, which of course is not a word in dictionaries, but he's a contact that I have, so that utterance was recognized, capitalized. You notice it, uh, it got the hashtag as a keyword. It put some punctuation at the end of the sentence. It will do these things automatically so that when I talk to the phone, the speech system is sophisticated enough to make the text come out just right. So let me send that text message along. Now, the last thing that I want to show you about the core experience on the phone, and then I'm going to talk about a bunch of value add across all these devices, is how we're going to improve the messaging experience. And to do that, we're going to switch over here to a motion study because this code is not yet ready for me to demo in a real build. What we're doing is we're building in support to the messaging app so that IP-based messaging systems, like the ones that mobile operators are rolling out, and Skype can be elegantly integrated right into messaging. So here you could see I was having an SMS conversation with Peter, but I switched over to Skype. And now, with, because the Skype network is so capable, as Peter is typing, as I'm getting my reply, you could see it, was show, it showed that he was typing, and the message came right in. We're going to be doing work to detect these Skype-capable endpoints and automatically move to Skype so that users get the richest possible messaging, ex possible messaging experience, communicate with the widest range of people, widest range of people, every work and everyone on Skype, including the cross-platform devices on which Skype runs. So we're thrilled to be building that part of the experience with our Skype team right into messaging, right into calling, and so you'll have that rich Skype experience as part of the phone. So, what you saw in the core experience of the phone and small tablet version of Windows 10 is it's tuned for devices under 8 inches. Um, it's designed to go with your PC as a great companion that's consistent and easy to learn. And with the Skype capability, we're going to enable the widest range of people to communicate with each other richly using messaging, calling, and video. But to get a full view of the kinds of things that we're putting on phones and small tablets, and today it's not even a complete view, but to get the full view, I need to talk to you about universal apps. Because we are building a wide family of universal apps that will ro round out the experience on phones, small tablets, and PCs. Um, you all. You all are aware that we have a platform for writing these universal apps that runs across devices, phones, tablets, PCs, even the Xbox. Um, and what we're doing is creating a family of apps that will be built in that will give our customers everything they need for modern productivity. So I'm going to show you a series of these apps. I'm going to show them to you on the phone and the PC. And I want you to think about how they make the experience um, rationalized and easy as you go from device to device, and they offer that mobility of experience that Terry was describing. The first one I'm going to focus on is Office. I think a lot, I think a lot of you know, and hard at work creating killer universal apps for Windows. And we've shown some early looks at these at some conferences, like our Build conference, but so far, only on the PC. Today, I'm going to show you a preview version of these on the phone. And just to be clear, um, what you're seeing are Office apps that are designed for Windows 10 and designed for touch. But we're going to continue to evolve our full Win32 Office apps specifically for the PC. These ones were made for devices with touch screens. So let me, uh, 
switch back over here. I'm still on the phone. And what I'm going to do is start with Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. Word, Excel, and PowerPoint will be included in Windows 10 on phones and small tablets. And they're going to deliver a consistent, highly rich, and highly complete Office experience on those devices. So uh, as I open up Word, you see I get the familiar recent document list. I'm going to choose this uh, pretty sophisticated Word document. And it first shows up here in page layout mode. But I'm going to use this button to switch to reflow mode, which is optimized for viewing on a touch-based device like a, a phone or a small tablet. And you can see here it's a very rich, complete Word document. The formatting is entirely accurate. But you really get a sense of the richness when I bring up the app bar down here at the bottom. Because what we've done is nicely format the familiar Office ribbon right into the app bar experience. Here's the Word Home tab, where I have all the formatting commands that I would expect to find in Word. I can switch the ribbon over to one of its different tabs. I'll switch to the Review tab. And you can imagine, if somebody sends me, I'm collaborating with somebody on a Word document, they've suggested some changes. I can now use the Review tab that I use all the time on the PC to move from change to change, accept a change, reject a change, add comments, read the comments, do my collaboration while I'm on the go. And with a device like this, you get a nearly no compromises experience in terms of completeness, fidelity, and richness as you're trying to create documents or collaborate with people on documents, we think this will be a great benefit to everybody trying to be productive on their phones. Now, I'm not going to show you Excel just in the interest of time, but I am going to show you PowerPoint. And so um, once again, you'll see I open PowerPoint. It's that familiar office look with the recent list right there. I'm going to open a very large and complex PowerPoint presentation. Here we go. And I want to point out that recent document list. It does roam from device to device, from version of Office to version of Office. So if I'm using full Win32 Office on my PC and editing a document in my OneDrive or OneDrive for Business, that recent list roams across devices. When I open up this PowerPoint presentation, I want to show you once again, here on the bottom of the screen, we've brought the familiar Office ribbon right to the phone's app bar experience. And I can switch here to transition view, to slideshow view, or to review view, just as I did on the phone. But I'm not going to do that. Instead, I want to show you how great a PowerPoint presentation can look when it's projected using any of the recent phones, which have hugely powerful processors and very capable graphics parts. So in this case, I'm going to pan through this, and you'll see, watch the screen, how smooth the animations and transitions are. That's an on-slide animation. I'm going to keep going. You'll see the hardware-accelerated slide transitions, and then again, a slide animation. And once again, hardware-accelerated transitions, slide animations. And all of that I'm doing today with a wire, just because we have lots of people doing wireless in here. But of course, we support Miracast, so you can present wirelessly. Um, with these Office apps, and as part of Windows 10 on phones and small tablets, we'll also support wireless printing. So we think this version of Office, tailored for Windows 10 on touch devices, will give people a very complete, easy to use, consistent cross-device productivity experience. OK, I'm going to keep going. Those three apps will come as part of the Windows 10 build on phones. And now I'm going to start talking about some apps that also come on the PC. I'm going to show you the Outlook Mail client first. Our Outlook team has been working on a new universal app version of Outlook Mail and Outlook Calendar, which will be on the phone, tablets, and PCs. So here's Outlook. The first thing I want to do here is uh, I want to show you the richness of the Outlook experience and how it fits into full office. So I'm going to open a mail message, and I'm going to choose to reply. Because the first thing I want to show you is that right here when I'm composing an email or replying to an email, I'm actually using the full Word engine that's now part of the phone experience. And I can prove that by pulling up the app bar. Right here in my Outlook mail experience, I get the same Word ribbon. I can do all that nice, rich Word formatting right here in my, my email experience. And sort of uh, the uh, 
intensely geeky part of my demo right here for all of you in the room who I know are very familiar with Word. Word's engine supports the lorem function, which I can enter, and when I press return, it provides a whole bunch of Greek text for me to be able to format and do cool things with, but in the interest of time, I won't do that. I will let you all try that yourselves when you get the insider builds of this, and you can play around with that full Word engine built right in here to the Outlook email on the phone. Um, I'm gonna keep going, and actually what I'm gonna do now, I wanna give you one quick look at messages here in the inbox, because the team has tried to ensure that you can use this in a very fast, convenient way. Um, whoops, I didn't mean to, uh, let me go back. Uh, what I'm gonna do here is go through and show you how the Outlook team has implemented this cool idea where a left swipe will delete, a right swipe will set a flag, and what that means is you can quickly go through a bunch of mail and figure out the stuff you wanna get rid of and the stuff you wanna keep. This modality will be familiar to some of you in the audience. I can go left and say no, no, no. I'll go right and say yes, 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 uh, no. And so, we'll do one more, yes. And so I can flag items, make them visible, and then, as I use this experience across my devices, let's switch over to the PC, you'll see here's that same code. It's literally the same code written to our universal app platform. Um, I was showing it to you on the phone, and here it is on the PC. This is the Outlook experience on the PC. This Outlook mail client will be part of Windows 10. There are sync just caught up. And I can, you can, you'll notice it's familiar, it looks very similar. On the PC, it has this personalizable image, which I've set to my son and I, um, and I can do the same UI. I can go left to remove, right to flag. Um, if I choose an, uh, an email, of course, it goes over there, and again, I have the same rich capability right there, and you see the ribbon is displayed in place on email. Now, I wanna keep going, because I wanna show you a bunch of these apps. So I'm gonna start speeding up, and I'm gonna attempt to do two-handed demoing on phone and PC at the same time. So the next thing I'm gonna do to the calendar. Uh, let me open the calendar, and you saw calendar, and you saw on the PC, I did this in a familiar way, just by right down there in the bottom, something lots of Outlook users are accustomed to. to. And here you can see the calendar is rich and attractive, it's familiar, um, it's high performance, scroll around all these items. Um, I'm now gonna zoom out on the PC, and you'll see I can zoom, I'm doing a pinch zoom. I'm going to zoom. I'm going to zoom all the way out to a month view. Then I'm going to zoom back in. And I can do this across both devices. I'll try to do it simultaneously. I'm zooming in to pick the number of days that I want. I can go to a single day view, but on this screen, that doesn't make sense. You'll see I have my appointments are categorized, so they show up in color on both devices. That's a quick look at calendar. Now, let me keep going, because we didn't focus only on sort of the apps that are kind of business oriented in their productivity. But we wanted to cover, you know, personal use cases that bleed over into business scenarios as well. So I want to give you a look at our brand new Photos app. Um, this is another universal app. It's implemented once and it runs across these devices. This is the same code running on the phone and the PC. So I'm gonna pan through here. I'll give you a look at the UI. You can see it's basically a simple, straightforward look at all my photos. And you can see on the phone there, it's caching images from OneDrive. Um, I'm gonna come back down here. You'll see on the left, I have this app switching UI and I can bring that up on the phone so you see what it looks like on the phone. It's the same code running on both devices, but formatted to fit the right screen. And hopefully, as you saw me pan through this collection, this was, man, that looks nice. Joe, Joe must have done a bunch of work to set it up for the demo. Well, what we're trying to do is make the software do the work for you. So I want to describe what's going on behind the scenes here. On any device that you own, even cross-platform devices, phones, where you're taking pictures, we have a OneDrive app, and it's built in on Windows devices, that uploads your images to OneDrive. On the PC, we're syncing your images down from OneDrive to the PC, so they're available locally offline, as well as in the cloud. This photo app is aggregating together all of those photos from all of those devices and giving you one simple view of your collection. If you want, you can go into the folders view and look at the detail, but we're gonna try to give you one simple view. Once you start doing that, some bad things will happen. You'll get duplicate photos that are showing up twice. You'll get photos that are a burst shot where you took three of them. Our collection view eliminates all those things for you automatically so that you get a look at 
the photos without seeing all that clutter. Another thing we do is we automatically enhance the photos to make them look nice. So uh, here's some photos going back in time, and this one is a good example of that auto-enhance mode. You notice up there in the toolbar, auto-enhance is on because it's on by default. But I'm going to show you what would it, this would look like if it was off. Um, I'm not sure I want that scary guy in my Christmas photo collection. Um, luckily, auto-enhance handles all these things for you. I'll turn it back on. You see the red eyes are removed, the face is brightened to just the right level of brightness, and so we've made the photo look better. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about the horrific Christmas sweater. Um, but we're still happy with the capabilities that we're building in on the PC and in the cloud to do this auto enhancement, which you'll get benefit from on all your devices. And um, in case you're one of those users that wants to do things manually, of course we will let you manage these settings yourself as well. You can turn any of these features off uh, and so on. Now, not everything I described is going to be in the first build for insiders, but the features will be coming. And there's one other feature of photos that I want to show that's not yet in our builds. So we're going to run a motion study here. And this is showing our albums feature. I mentioned how we're going to automatically remove dupes, automatically improve the way pictures look. We're going to also automatically create albums. And so what you see here in the collection view at the top are automatic albums that we created. And we do this by detecting the place, the time, the people that we're all in a series of photos, and then we create a collection, which we call an album. Um, if we can, we give it a name. We let you manage it yourself if you'd like to, but we'll do it for you. When I open one of these albums, you'll see we choose a hero image, the one that we think looks best. We show you the people that are in the album. That's me with my kids doing a 5K run. And then we choose a sample set of photos that we think tell the story of the event. We format them so they look nice on the screen. We handle all of that automatically for you. It's in the cloud, so then if you'd like to share that album with other people, you can. Our intention here is to have a Photos app that exists on all these devices and that deals with the complexity of all the images you're taking with your multiple devices and, and make it work consistent across all of them. It's that mobility of experience that Terry was talking about. And part of it we can do because we're implementing it one time using our universal platform. Now, I got three more apps I'm going to show you. I'm going to go even faster so you get a sense of overview. We're going to do this by motion study. The first one is our People app, which we're implementing, again, as a universal app, one time across these devices. It aggregates all the people you care about across social networks, um, and it lets you uh, perform quick actions like making a call or sending a message or doing a Skype video call. Um, next up, our music experience, which we're continuing to evolve across all these devices. And what you'll see here is how we're using the cloud to add a song to a playlist, and then it shows up magically on all your devices. That's because in about a month or two months, we're going to add support to our system for you to put your music collection in OneDrive and have your collection stored in the cloud so you can make changes to your playlists or to your collection on any device, and they're automatically reflected on all your devices. Next up, I want you to see our Maps experience, which starts with some Cortana integration. Cortana has recognized that traffic is slow, so you can open the Maps app on your PC, find an alternate route, send it to your phone, and then when you use the turn-by-turn -turn directions to drive somewhere and you arrive, you can have Cortana remember where you parked your car, and then when your event's over, she's there to help you find where you parked. So, that is a quick tour of a, our family of universal apps that we're building for the phones, small tablets, and PCs, and which we intend to deliver everything that you need for modern productivity, and which we intend to give you that mobile experience tailored for each device. In particular, we're excited to have Office, bringing a version of Office built for Windows 10 and optimized for touch with Word, Excel, and PowerPoint on the default phone experience and available in the store on the PC, and with a new Outlook mail and calendar rounding out the experience so it's great for productivity. I have one more app experience. 
And to do that, I want to get you thinking about the state of the web. The web is indispensable. Everybody's using it all the time. And over the last number of years, it's evolved hugely, in large part because of the explosion of highly powerful mobile devices. We've seen site authors evolving their sites in an interesting way and targeting a wide, targeting a wide range of devices. And since we've had this rapid evolution of the web, and since we're building this new set of devices on Windows 10 with a universal platform, we think it's the right time to build a new browser for the modern web, which will empower our next generation of Windows users on Windows 10. So today, I'm excited to introduce you to a code name, Project Spartan, our new web browsing experience for Windows 10. So Project Spartan has a number of parts. Uh, first, it has a new rendering engine under the covers that's built to be compatible with how the web is written today. It has a new look and feel, which you see on the screen, that it fits right in with all this family of Windows 10 applications. And we're especially working on three significant new features to make you more productive on the web as you use Project Spartan. So I'm going to switch over for the last demo and let you take a look at Project Spartan running on the PC. Now, Project Spartan will not be in our very first Insider builds. It's going to come a little later, and it'll come to the phone a little after that. Now, I'm going to show you it only on the PC today, but it is coming to the phone. The first thing you'll notice here is the new UI is streamlined. It fits in with the design language of Windows 10, and you can see the focus is on the content on the page. Um, but what I want to do is just give you a, a taste of these three significant new features we're working on to help people be more productive. The first one is about how you can interact with the web, and in particular, how you might communicate with other people about the web. So, you know, sometimes web articles come out and people want to post them to Facebook or they want to talk to other people about them. There's a lot of interaction that happens with content on the web. And this happened to our team about two weeks ago. And it happened when this article posted on the internet. This article comes out, and you can imagine all of us are simultaneously horrified and kind of happy. Um, and so, of course, within our team, we communicated with each other about this article on the web, but we had Spartan. So we didn't simply send emails. Many of us had devices that work with pens or styluses, which I have here. So I'm going to switch into the first of these big three features, our note-taking mode. And you could imagine when I saw this, uh, I saw this and I said, oh, baby, you know, sometimes you guys don't get it right, but sometimes you do. So, you know, we saw this and we were excited and we communicated with each other by marking up the web directly. And in this case, you know, I'm using a stylus, but I could do it with just my finger if I don't have a pen handy. If I want to make a little smiley face to show just how happy I am, that's possible too. And so now we have this way of expressing our thoughts right on the canvas of the web. It was interesting because this article came out and a bunch of people speculated, oh, I hope Microsoft isn't only doing this for devices with touch and pen. We're not. Um, so let me show you how we're going to support the mode of communicating about documents that millions of people have been doing for years and years with Word. They can click anywhere and add a comment using their keyboard. Hmm, this is a good idea. Um, so you could imagine, as we saw this article, some people had touch devices, some didn't. Everyone could comment on it using whatever form of input they had. You know, if it's touch, then it's natural. If it's a keyboard, then it's familiar. And so once I've marked up this page, there's a bunch of things I can do with it, of course. What we've done is we've frozen the web page. And that means that the content that might change on it is, is sort of snapped in time, but the links are still alive. I can then share that whole page or save that whole page for myself with my markup, or I can go over here, I'm going to grab this clipping tool, and I'm going to just pull out this particular segment. You can see there I could save it to my OneNote, because I keep a bunch of notes on things as I browse the web when I'm planning trips and so on. I could copy it to the clipboard, or I could come right up here and use the system's built-in system for sharing to share that with other people. I could share it on Facebook. I could share it on Twitter. I could share it through my email experience in a consistent way. And now I have a rich canvas for not only expressing my thoughts, on the web, but for sharing them with other people as well. So that's the first of our three significant end user features. The second thing that we tried to do was focus on the action of reading. People are 
I mean, the predominant action on the web is reading. You're reading and reading and reading and reading. And we felt if we could make that just a few percentage points better, then we'd significantly affect the overall productivity of people on the web. So there are a few things we did. The first thing we did was we looked at how we could take and sort of standardize a great way to read sites on the web, which are variant in their level of complexity and so on. So here's a, an article on Bon Appetit. I'm going to switch into my reading mode right here, and you'll see we discoverably make available a standardized format way for you to read stuff on the web. And you can personalize this to your liking so that you have a way to experience the wide range of content out there on a the web in a way that might feel familiar to you. We didn't stop there. We also added a reading list right into the core browsing experience. And of course, this will show up on whatever device you have. Um, I can add items to the reading list, it's a mobile experience that goes to whatever device I'm using. And we do one more thing, which is that we'll take the content in your reading list and save it offline. So if you find yourself stuck on a flight with no Wi-Fi and your mobile device is with you, well, Spartan will deliver you content to read wherever you are. And then the last thing that we wanted to do was we wanted to make sure that we supported the broadest set of content that's out there on the web. So we built in support for PDF files. And you see right here, I have a sample PDF file. I can add that to my reading list. I can mark it up with notes in the note-taking mode. It'll be saved offline and so on. So we're really trying to ensure that the widest range of content on the web is available for people to read wherever they are. OK, last thing. The third thing that we tried to do to make people more productive on the web was to give you a personal assistant to help you be productive on the web. So we're building Cortana right into Spartan. And the idea is that Cortana will show up at the right opportune moments to help you get things done. So there's some simple things she can do. So if I'm in my address bar and I'm curious about the weather, I can start typing weather, and Cortana will pop up and be helpful in simple situations like that. But because she knows you, she can help in more interesting and nuanced ways at times that might surprise you a little bit. So let's say it's my sister's birthday. It's not, but for demo purposes, let's imagine it's my sister's birthday. And her friends are having a surprise birthday party for her tonight. Remember my wife has that flight that's coming in that Cortana's tracking for me? Man, is my wife going to get here in time for us to make it to the party? I'm not sure. I might go to the Delta website to look up my wife's flight, but luckily Cortana knows that I'm tracking a flight because she's learning things about me all the time. And she can save me time and effort by popping up as I'm about to navigate somewhere on the web which, with what might be an answer to a question that I have in mind. So that's yet another example of how Cortana can help out. Similarly, as I'm browsing the web, Cortana can be right there at my fingertips, ready to let me know things about the pages I'm looking at. So you can see here, my sister's party is going to be at this restaurant called Cuoco. Um, my wife is gluten-free, dairy-free, and I'm on a crazy diet for New Year's. And so we have this concern about a restaurant and what's on the menu, and I wonder, like, how am I going to get there from here? You notice when I visit the restaurant site, Cortana has popped up right here to tell me she knows about this place because, again, Cortana is scouring the internet, learning about people and places and getting smarter all the time. Um, she's telling me she's got directions, hours, and more. When I click, she shows up right here within the web browser to give me details about this place. She's telling me directions from where I'm at right now, and I can make those available on whatever device I'm on. She's, she can book a reservation for me. She shows me the hours. I can read reviews and so on. Remember my concern about the menu? Well, Cortana's there to help, too. She knows where the menu for this restaurant is on the internet. She makes it readily available. And if I'm curious about ingredients as I scan down this, I know what a lot of these things are. I'm not so sure about rapini. I can just right click and ask Cortana, and she's right there with an answer. Luckily, Rapini, only 2.7 grams of carbs, so that'll be okay for me on my New Year's diet. That's a quick look at Project Spartan. It's a new implementation of a web browsing experience built on our new universal platform, and it, go, it goes cross device. It's great at productivity with note taking right on the web. Um, we're trying to tune the reading experience to make people more efficient, and it's the only browser with a personal assistant built right in. Okay, 
That is my look at Windows 10 and where we're at and a whole bunch of features that will be coming for insiders to try out over the next few months, three, four, five months. These things will all come in at different times. What you saw today was an early look at where we're at in the development of these. We're bringing Cortana to the PC and we're gonna change the way people use PCs through this natural interaction. Project Spartan is a new browsing experience tuned for being mobile and working across these devices. We have a family of universal apps, including Office, that are gonna make people productive with these devices. And in all cases, the user experience is tuned to a wide variety of form factors, so you get benefit from things like Continuum, where your device will adapt to how you use it. There is one big app experience that I didn't talk about. I was focused on productivity. But we care just as much about entertainment, people having fun on our devices. So to cover that off, I'm excited to introduce to the stage Phil Spencer, who's going to take you through gaming and entertainment in Windows 10. Come on out, Phil. Thanks, Joe. Good morning. I'm Phil Spencer, and as the head of the Xbox team, I lead the talented and creative teams responsible for gaming at Microsoft. I'm incredibly proud to be here with you this morning to talk about gaming on Windows 10. Earlier, you heard Terry describe our vision for more personal computing. I'm here to talk about how games as a form of entertainment are incredibly personal. We're not just viewers, we're participants. Whether we're in the trenches with our friends fighting for survival or winning the race against the best drivers in the world or exploring and building new worlds, gaming has always been inherently personal. We're deeply invested in our worlds and our play when we can share our triumphs, our stories, and our greatest creations with our friends. We at Xbox have the most active social network of gamers in the world with Xbox Live, with over 50 million members. And by combining the feedback from this great community with our vision for making all aspects of computing more personal, we've identified several ways to make PC gaming even more incredible than it is today. Gaming has become a much more social activity, with everything from friendly co-op between close friends to professional tournaments with hundreds of people spread across continents. Connection and community are central to the game experience. Today, we'll show you how gaming on Windows 10 will be more social and interactive by bringing together the best of the games you love to play, the people you play with, and the epic moments they create. All of this comes together in the Xbox app on Windows 10. I wanna take this opportunity to show you the app. It starts with my games, which is the collection of everything I play on any device. My friends list connects me to all my friends by gamertag, wherever they are and wherever I am. Messages keeps me in touch across all Windows 10 devices, Xbox, and the web. And the heartbeat of Xbox Live is the activity feed, which lists all the important gaming moments for me and my friends. Now I'm gonna launch the app and show you the section, show you live working code here. So I have this nice Alienware PC that my friends let me use, I appreciate that. Clicking the start menu. On every Windows 10 PC and tablet, you will have the Xbox app. And here it is. You see the sections that I mentioned. Now down the left, you have my, my gamer picture, my gamer tag, my score, the games I play, this is my games. I'll come back to the activity feed in a second. And down the right, you have all of my friends. One thing I didn't say about friends in the messaging area is I'm able to voice chat and text chat across platform with all of my friends on Xbox Live. Now, the activity feed, for those that don't know, this is the area where everything that happens on Xbox Live is shared to all of the friends and followers that you have. I have a friend, Melody Bolton, here. She's an amazing Minecraft creator. Now, some of you might have heard Minecraft, of Minecraft. It's something that last year we were able to bring into the Microsoft Studios collection of games, and I'm always incredibly inspired by the community there and what they create. So this is a clip that she created on Xbox One. Just like people taking photos with Instagram and sharing them with their friends, people do this on Xbox Live all the time. So let's look at this clip. Now, she's told me to wait till the end because there's a special creation at the end of this clip. So here we go. 
go. TNT is always a favorite in the Minecraft world. Ah, very nice. Okay, so I like this clip. I want to share it with all of my friends and all of my followers on Xbox Live. I'm able to friend, uh, like it by clicking on the heart icon. I can leave a comment telling people to watch until the end. and then post that comment. Now, as I said, on console, we've seen millions and millions of these clips created and shared. And you can do this on Windows today. There's special hardware and other applications that allow you to create game DVR clips. But we thought about how could we bring this technology right into the operating system itself, allowing people from any Windows game to share those epic moments. As I said before, Windows gaming is incredibly vibrant today. I happen to be a big Steam customer, so let me go into Steam. You see all of my friends down on uh, all of my games down the left on Steam. Steam runs incredibly well on Windows 10. I'm using it to launch one of my favorite current games, Sid Meier Beyond Earth. So this is a game that obviously shipped before Windows 10 was even a word. Uh, it knows nothing about Xbox Live, but it's obviously running on Windows 10. I'm going to launch it, and I'm going to show you how the game DVR feature on Windows works. So let me just start a single player game. I'm just going to start a, a simple game from the beginning so you'll see it. Come on, there it is. Play. So here's the game. So I'm going to make a couple moves. Move these guys. Oh, scary green wasp guys. Okay, with a simple click, Control G, uh, Windows G, excuse me, Windows G. I bring up the UI for saving gameplay clips on any Windows, any Windows game. Now, usually what will happen, what you see in a lot of apps will allow you to do this. You click the red circle, you start a recording session, you record the gameplay that you want, then you can store that off. But what we found on console is those epic moments are unexpected. It's something that you weren't expecting to happen, and on the console, with a couple clicks of the button, you're actually able to save the last 30 seconds of gameplay, something you didn't know and you're really surprised. And we wanted to build that right into Windows 10 as well. So by clicking on this icon here, I'm actually capturing the last 30 seconds of gameplay on any game running on Windows. Click it, you see the toast come up here, it shows the clip has been recorded, it takes me back into the Xbox app where I can do the same things I can do on the Xbox. I can clip from either side, I can share it to Xbox Live, which you saw Melody do, what Melody did with her Minecraft app uh, uh, clip, or I can share on any other social network. Now I'm gonna choose to share this out to OneDrive, which will give me the video clip from uh, the game DVR from Civilization Beyond Earth, and I can take that and share it anywhere. We think this will create more incredible viralness for the game developers uh, and the gaming fans out there who want to share their moments. You know, bringing more power to Windows 10 gaming is incredibly important to us. Now, the DirectX is the graphic subsystem inside of Windows 10, and DirectX will make the games you're playing today even better. What you're going to see on screen here is a visual comparison that's under development at FutureMark, which shows the same piece of hardware running DirectX 11 and a DirectX 12. And we're adding more complexity to the scene. And actually, eventually, the DirectX 11 side is going to stop. Frame rate effectively hits zero. And you can see the DirectX 12 side continues to add complexity and continues to keep a high frame rate. Again, same piece of hardware running, one on DirectX 11, one on DirectX 12. Performance has always been incredibly important in DirectX. And what we've done with DirectX 12 is we've given developers much more fine control of CPU and GPU, giving them direct control. And for CPU-bound games, this will actually increase the performance of those games by up to 50%, which is going to allow developers to create amazing scenes on, on screen. Their artists will go crazy with the amount of complexity that they can add. But with DirectX 12, we also know that people are playing millions of games on phones today and other devices that are powered by battery. So we thought, how can we take advantage of the increased performance, but also focus on, but also focus on battery life? People want to play those games longer. They want them to look great. So, and our focus on power consumption, we've actually cut the power consumption required in half 
for the same scenes from people using DirectX 11, which means you're gonna see more incredible games on mobile devices that people can play for even a longer time. I think it'll be great for the, you know, the huge mobile gaming development out there, and you see more and more high-end mobile games that are just really taking advantage of the graphic capability. Now, none of this is possible if we're not getting the adoption from the studios out. Hundreds of studios were incredibly happy, incredibly happy that they're already using DirectX 12. Our friends at Epic with the Unreal Engine 4 have adopted DirectX 12. I'm announcing today that our friends at Unity, one of the largest game engines in the industry, have also adopted DirectX 12, which will unlock the DirectX 12 capability to the thousands of developers out there, from schools to high-end developers, to take advantage of what DirectX brings. Now today, people are playing games on more devices than ever. And with Windows 10, we wanted to focus on those gaming scenarios across device with the Xbox that we're bringing to Windows 10 and our first party portfolio. So please help me in welcoming my friend Lauren from Lionhead Studios, who will come out on stage. Hi, Phil. Now I'm actually in a game right now, so if you wanna have a look at your friends list, you'll see me and you'll be able to join my game. There she is, LH, LH Albion Girl, Lauren Carter, and she is playing Fable Legends on that Xbox One right there. I'm on this Windows 10 device that I showed you earlier, running the Xbox app, and by simply clicking on her name, I can join her game right now. So Fable Legends is the latest in the popular Fable RPG series, and today we're excited to announce that the game will be coming to Windows 10 PC as well as the Xbox One. Right, let's go get those creatures, Phil. I'm here to help. So Phil's playing on his Windows 10 PC, and I'm on the Xbox One. What's great about Legends on Windows 10 is it enables PC players to play with or against players on the Xbox One. We're also using DirectX 12 to give our players a gorgeous world like they've never seen before. Okay. Oh, the ogre. Oh, there's quite a few bad guys. <laughs> we can do it. Nice. And there's the treasure. How's that for gossip? So later this year, join Fable Legends as a hero or villain on Windows 10 PC and on the Xbox One. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Good job. Now, for those that were watching on my screen, you might have seen that I received an achievement. Just like I have on Xbox 360, Xbox One, achievements are an incredible part of our Xbox Live ecosystem. I got an achievement, it showed up in my activity feed. All of my friends know that, okay, I got this achievement on uh, playing Fable Legends. We think enabling people to play multiplayer games on Windows 10, multiplayer games across Xbox One and Windows 10 will really unlock the potential of Xbox Live and grow the social network that's there today. Now today, we've talked about the games that you already own and how we can make those better with DirectX 12, how we can make those better with features like games D Game DVR. We've talked about your existing hardware and how that will get better with DirectX 12. But one thing we haven't talked about is the library of games you already own on Xbox One, especially the console exclusive games which aren't available on Windows. Wouldn't it be great if we could play those games from anywhere in our house, from the couch, out back, in my bedroom? I'm here to announce that with Windows 10, we will enable streaming of Xbox One games to any Windows 10 PC or tablet in your home later this year. And I'm going to show you a demo of that on stage right now. So I'm now moving over to this Surface Pro 3 here. There it is. Now, if you follow me and watch what I play at all, you know I'm a big Forza fan. So I wanted to take this opportunity to show off one of my favorite games, Forza Horizon 2. You see it in my recently played games list here. Now, I've already set up a relationship between this Surface and my Xbox One in my home. 
I do that one time, the Xbox app will find all of the Xbox Ones in your home and you set up that relationship. So in my games, it's actually showing me all of the games that are installed on my Xbox One and making them available right here inside the application. So I can click on Forza Horizon 2 and you see stream from the Xbox One. And we're starting the stream. And here we are. Now I'm going to pause state on Forza Horizon 2. In a second, I'm going to unpause it, and you'll see the, the game running from an Xbox One, streaming to this, three, this uh, Surface Pro 3, and me controlling it with this controller. So here we go. Love this game. Now you can see frame rate, resolution, the game looks great. I'm a playing against AI characters right now. I could be playing a multiplayer game. I'm going to try to pass at least one person. Yeah, okay, so we got past one. I can bring up the Xbox UI right here. Now, if I'm the, I know I'm done playing with the click of a button, I'm actually able to turn off the console right here from the Xbox app as well, and I'm going to do that. And I'm back in the Xbox app. We think it's an amazing unlock for our Xbox One customers that they're going to be able to play the great library of games that they already own on any Windows 10 PC or tablet in the home. I hope you've enjoyed a look at some of the exciting changes coming to make gaming even better on Windows. We've seen how Xbox on Windows 10 will bring an entirely new integrated experience for connecting gamers across devices, and how Windows 10 is bringing new capability to games you already own. And how Windows 10 will unlock your existing library of games on Xbox One to enable play on all of your Windows 10 devices. And while Xbox is coming to Windows, Windows 10 is also coming to Xbox One. Joe did a great job of demoing amazing Windows features, and you should wait to hear more from us as those features find their way onto Xbox. Now, with Xbox, with Xbox moving to Windows, I don't think we're going to see millions of people using Excel on their Xbox, but I do know for developers that want to bring their application over to the television screen, this is going to make it very easy for them to do so. At Microsoft, we work hard to create the most fun and engaging games and entertainment experiences. And to be successful and to meet the high expectations of a passionate fan base, we have to put the gamer at the center of every experience. This philosophy is not only foundational to Xbox, but it's been central to the development of the gaming experiences on Windows 10. You have my commitment and the commitment of the entire Xbox team that we will treat gaming on Windows 10 with as much passion and energy as we have with the Xbox console. You'll see the result of that across the Windows gaming experience, in the games portfolio for Microsoft Studios and our partners, and in the Xbox Live service itself. New ways to connect with friends, new ways to extend your gaming experience across devices, new ways to make games even better, all with you the gamer at the center. Now this is just the beginning of our discussion about gaming on Windows 10. We're gonna continue this throughout the year. The next big beat for us is the Game Developers Conference in March, where we hear more from us on how we continue to build out the great gaming experience on Windows 10. You know, though, this wouldn't be an Xbox presentation if we didn't bring a little sizzle video. So here's a video of how all of this comes together. Please take a look, and thanks for your time. That's some really cool stuff. 
Now, Joe and Phil just shared with you some incredible new Windows 10 experiences, and we don't want to keep you waiting. So in the next week, we will be releasing a new build of Windows 10 to our insiders. And then, after the Seahawks win the Super Bowl, we will be releasing <laughs> our first build of Windows 10 on phones. And with these new builds, we will be increasing the number of languages which Windows 10 is available in from 4 to 25. As the features roll out, we are looking for that feedback from our insiders. How natural is con Continuum on your 2-in-1? How easy is it to edit Office Docs on your phone? How fun is it to record a Windows game with Xbox Game DVR? We are looking forward to feedback from insiders all over the world. And now, let's really switch gears and talk about entirely new Windows 10 experiences. I showed you earlier how we envisioned Windows 10 in the workplace. On the wall, there's this large screen. It's facilitating a communal experience. The group is viewing a 3D model. The group is participating in a Skype call. We saw an opportunity to create a great new Windows experience for a device like this. But the de no device like it existed. So we've created the first device of its kind for the Windows family. Let me introduce Hyatt to show you more. Thanks, Terry. Good morning, everybody. So we've built a new device to unlock the power of the group in a workplace. I am delighted to introduce you to the Microsoft Surface Hub. This is an 84-inch 4K display with integrated compute. It has built-in sensors that actually detected me when I came to the screen. It has built-in cameras, speakers, mics, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC. It's got it all. All you need is one cable to get started. So why don't we get started? Right from the welcome screen, I can get to work. I can call, I can whiteboard, or I can connect my personal device to share content onto the screen. While I could talk to you about many scenarios on the Surface Hub, we're going to focus on two things today, two key scenarios. Brainstorming, and number two, meetings. And as you may have noticed, when I picked up that pen, the whiteboard automatically launched. And what you're seeing here is OneNote. OneNote designed for the large screen. I can write, and the ink is just fluid. It doesn't lag. Just like a pen on paper. I can even move things around. I can make more space if I need to. But of course, it is not only about inking and a digital whiteboard. It's about how we bring rich data to inform the brainstorming. So let me ask David to join me so that we can show you what it looks like on the Surface Hub. Hi, David. Hi, Ayat. Hi, everyone. Let's open up a 3D model of the Surface Hub. Because this is a Windows 10 device, I can bring all sorts of content onto the device, including applications. In this case, David is opening a Siemens application showcasing the 3D rendering of our Surface Hub. As you can see, he can zoom in, zoom out, rotate, look at different views so that he can get insights. Hey, David, do you mind putting the app side by side with the whiteboard? Sure. I think I've seen something I'd like you to capture for me. Can you find the camera for me, maybe? Yep, yeah. there it is. Can you clip it to the whiteboard? Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> so as you can see, I was able to capture an image of the app, put it on the whiteboard, and even take notes on it. And because this is OneNote, I can actually save it to my OneNote or send an email. So no need to take pictures 
of your whiteboard with your phone anymore. So we've discussed brainstorming. Let's switch gears now. Let's discuss meetings, because we have lots of those. And I think we can all agree, those meetings could be better. Do you know that it takes an average of 12 minutes to start a meeting? From the time you bring people on the call to bringing content, this is not a good use of our time. So let me show you what we can do on the Surface Hub. So David and I are having a meeting with our colleagues, and we're going to be discussing the design of a pen. The meeting is already scheduled on the Surface Hub with one tap. One tap, I can join the meeting. The remote attendees automatically join the call. The content that is on the screen, they can see it as well. They can see what David is writing. And of course, we can see them. It's that easy with the Surface Hub. And what you're seeing here on the screen is Skype for Business. It is designed for the large screen. It's taking full advantage of the hardware, the mics, the speakers, and the dual cameras. Hi, team. Hi. <laughs> so why don't we bring some content to this conversation? After all, this is a meeting. In meetings, quite often, it is challenging to bring content onto the screen. And with the Microsoft Surface Hub, we've made it very easy for you to be able to project your content from any device via wireless or wired. And in this case, David is going to be projecting for us a deck that he prepared on the pen. Hey, David, do you mind bringing the slide on the portfolio of pens? The portfolio of pens, sure. I think that's the slide you're looking for. Actually, I meant this one. So, Tim, this is the, the pen we would like to consider for final design. So, as you can see, I could move the content on the screen, and I could even ink on it. And not only could the remote participants see what I was doing, everything I did on the screen is reflected back on David's device. This is what we call ink back and touch back. Another great example of mobility with Windows 10. So now we've made a decision. We're ready to end the meeting. All I need to do is go to the Start button and end the session with one tap. The content from the meeting is now shared with all the participants in the meeting, and the device gets cleaned up. It is now ready for use for the next meeting. It is that easy with the Microsoft Surface Hub. I'm very proud of what we've shown you today. The best work we do is when we come together. And we believe that with the Surface Hub, we will be able to unlock the power of the group in a workplace. It brings the best tool to create and brainstorm. It'll make your meetings productive and engaging. And it delivers a platform for amazing large screen application. And of course, it is designed in such a way that you can deploy it anywhere in the enterprise, from your office, to the huddle room, to the conference room. And we look forward to seeing our partners embracing this experience. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hayat. Now let's talk about the second entirely new Windows experience today. We were inspired by the idea of mixing our applications and games back into the real world. But obviously, no technology exists of its kind to make this possible. Now, in my decades in this industry, there's been a few times, a few key moments, where a technology or an experience has just blown me away. And we've created one of those experiences with Windows 10. And right here, right now, we're going to share it with you. So please welcome Alex Kitman. Thank you, Terry. And good morning, everyone. A few years ago, we started asking ourselves, could we make things so simple that technology would just disappear? Could we make technology more human 
and easier to control? Could Windows make your digital life more powerful by connecting it with your real life? Could we place your digital content right into your world, right into your life, with more reality than ever before? Until now, we've immersed ourselves in the world of technology. But what if we could take technology and bring it into our world? Just as punch cards turn to keyboards and mice turn to touch, with each major advancement in input and output, technology becomes more personal. Each advancement decreases the distance between us and technology. Each step brings us closer to more personal ways of computing. And today, today, we take the next step. Now, I know what you might be thinking, but no, we're not talking about putting you into virtual worlds. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm really excited about all of the progress being made in virtual reality. But virtual reality may not be for everyone. We're dreaming beyond virtual worlds, beyond screens, beyond pixels, and beyond today's digital borders. We're dreaming about holograms mixing your world. Welcome to a new era of Windows. Welcome to Windows Holographic. Look around. Technology is all around us. We use it in every aspect of our lives. It enables us to do amazing things. But what if we could go further? What if we could go beyond the screen? Where your digital world is blended with your real world. Now we can. This is the world with holograms. What will they enable us to do? New ways to visualize our work. I have an idea for the fuel tank. New ways to share ideas with each other. How are things going your end? I just put the images in one drive. Perfect. more immersive ways to play. New ways to teach and learn. So put the new trap in the place of the old one. Now what? And tighten here and here. New ways to collaborate and explore the places we've never been. Look at this formation. Let's take a closer look. new ways to create the things we imagine. Because when you change the way you see the world, you can change the world you see. This is your world with holograms. This is the world with holograms. And today, you'll not only see that holograms are real, but more importantly, this afternoon, every single person in this room will experience holograms for themselves in our labs. So how do we get here? Let's think by way of example about human beings. We are constantly processing terabytes of information from all around us. We are sensing and we're absorbing infinite noise and translating it into very simple signals. Just think about catching a ball. We can perform this action from a very early age. Nobody had to teach us about it. We didn't have to go to years of advanced math or physics to learn how to do it. It's inherent 
in what makes us human. Now imagine if technology had the same sensing capability to process all of this input about the world around us so that we could see the world as we see it. That would give us new ways to interact with technology, new ways to communicate, new ways to create, and new ways to explore. That's the dream we've been pursuing, and that's what you get when you mix holograms in our world. Imagine an engineer seeing instructions overlaid and in the context of their work. Imagine an architect walking around their designs all while their clients are reviewing it remotely. Imagine a surgeon learning a procedure without ever having to pick up a scalpel. Or imagine my personal favorite. Imagine turning your living room into a surreal gaming environment. Now, I know this sounds perhaps crazy, maybe even, even a little bit impossible. But this is why I fell in love with this art form at a very, very early age. In software, nothing is impossible. At best, things are improbable. And with a little bit of luck and a lot of pixie dust, the improbable becomes possible and holograms can become part of our everyday life. Holographic computing enabled by Windows 10 is here. Every Windows 10 device has APIs focused on human and environment understanding. Holographic APIs are enabled inside every Windows 10 build, from the little screens to the big screens to no screens at all. At its core, Windows has always been built with an ecosystem of partners. Throughout our history, we have brought new attributes to Windows in ways that empower not only developers, but also our device makers to unleash their creativity to the world. Windows Holographic was created from the ground up with that same heritage in mind. Want to create a holographic app? Easy. Developers, Windows 10 is yours. Holograms are Windows Universal apps. And all Windows Universal apps can be made to work with Windows Holographic. We invite you to unleash your imagination and come create experiences not possible on any other device or any other platform. Want to create a device powered by human or environment understanding? Build for Windows 10. Oculus, Magic Leap, Glass developers, and everyone else. We humbly invite you. Come create holograms with us. But we knew we needed more than just software to make holograms in our world a reality. So we invented the most advanced holographic computer the world has ever seen. I'm incredibly excited to introduce to you Microsoft HoloLens. This is the first fully untethered holographic computer. HoloLens is real, and this will be available in the Windows 10 timeframe. You guys want to take a look at what's inside? HoloLens has see-through holographic high-definition lenses. This is how we can see holograms right into our world, right into our lives, with more reality than ever before. HoloLens has spatial sound, so we can hear holograms even when they're behind us. It has advanced sensors to capture information about what we're doing and the environments we're in. Now, HoloLens comes with a built-in 
high-end CPU and GPU. But that wasn't enough. To handle all the processing required to understand the world around us, we had to go beyond the traditional CPU and GPU. So we invented a third processor, a holographic processing unit. The HPU gives us the ability to understand where you're looking, to understand your gestures, to understand your voice. It gives us the ability to spatially map the entire world around us and to run without any wires, all while processing terabytes of information from all of these sensors, all in real time. This is everything we need to step into the holographic landscape. All we need to create, all we need to consume, and all we need to share holographic experiences. HoloLens enables holographic computing natively with no markers, no external cameras, no wires, no phone required, and no connection to a PC needed. We believe Windows 10 will fundamentally make everything people do with computers today more valuable, more immersive, and more personal. Let's listen to what developers that have for years been working on Windows Holographic think about the possibilities. When you think about how you experience technology today, it's like behind this glass screen. And you're kind of stuck, it feels cold. We've unlocked the screen. Really what we're trying to do is break down the walls between you know, technology and people. This is the next generation of computing. This, this is the next PC. It's basically a see-through display that you wear, and it lets you see holograms in your world, in your space, all around you. The hologram itself, it is light and it's an imagination incarnate. The ability to draw with your hand or to take an asset, you know, an image and move it or scale it is a very natural way of interacting with it. Here's what you can do with holographic video. Here's what you can do with using your world as a game level. Here's what you can do with taking the power of, of 3D modeling and creation and guess what, pulling it out of a screen into real 3D and then sharing what you've created with others. That was science fiction and now we're bringing it into science fact. This is by far, far, far the hardest, most complex, most challenging, and most intriguing thing I've ever done in my life. We just recently started engaging with third parties to build applications for the device, and the things they're doing just, uh, they're humbling. When you've got a thousand different people from all different backgrounds with all different types of experience, you're gonna see that the stuff that we've built at the beginning is just a tiny scratching of the surface of you know, what this technology can do and what it can mean for people. When the other perspectives come to it and all the creatives out there, it's gonna blow our minds. This is a new medium for artistic expression and a new medium for creation that we've just never had before. This platform is going to truly blend your digital life with your physical life. And it, it is so thrilling. This is truly about seeing the world in a whole different way. As you just saw, holograms are being sculpted by some of the most creative people around. But holograms are not just for creative people they can unleash the creativity in all of us. Remember the first time you experienced Microsoft Paint or Solitaire? Those timeless experiences let you discover what a mouse and keyboard world felt like. In that same timeless fashion, we wanted you to discover what a holographic landscape feels like. So we created Holo Studio. Holo Studio allows you to create your very own holograms. It allows you to 3D print them and then share them with the world. 
Are you guys ready to see your very first live holographic experience all running on Windows 10? Please help me welcome on stage my dearest friend, Lorraine. <laughs> Hi, Lorraine. Hi, Alex. So as Lorraine gets set up, let me walk you a little bit on what you're going to see. I'll point your attention to this screen here behind me, where at first you're going to see through Lorraine's eyes. You're going to see exactly what she's seeing um, in the hologram spin to the world. Then as we start building, we'll swap to this custom camera rig right here so you can easily understand how holograms fit into your world. So let's meet our first holographic um, person, and who better to introduce us to this holographic landscape than our very own Terry Meyerson. <laughs> and look how well and pinned Terry is. Now remember, Lorraine is seeing the hologram in space in real time. Shall we play it, Lorraine? Play. Wow. Nice work, Windows 10. I'm a freaking hologram. Welcome to Windows Holographic. Windows knows exactly where Lorraine is looking. And with a simple gesture, Lorraine can launch Holo Studio. With Holo Studio, anyone can create personalized 3D creations in just minutes. For today's creation, Lorraine is going to create our very own customized quadcopter. Now, Lorraine, what kind of custom design for the quadcopter are you thinking about today? Well, I'm sort of a space nut, so I thought I would go with a UFO theme. And I think you'll see I've got this cool ray gun shape I'm going to use in a minute. Ooh, I like it. As Lorraine um, starts building, you notice that everything is as easy as tap, then gaze, then tap again. Now, voice commands are amazing in Hollow Studio because HoloLens understands precisely where she's staring at. Glue touching. OK, let's get some color on this, Alex. I think I'll go with a bright yellow. Let's put some of that here and there. Now, as Lorraine finishes building the first leg of the quadcopter, she's going to have to create three more. And notice how easy it is for her to mirror and then copy it. Mirror. OK, I've got two, but I'm going to need four of these, Alex. Let's get it right, oh, right down. There. Good. Glue. That side. Good. Copy. OK, I've got four, but it's oriented wrong. Rotate. Movement. Hollow Studio is an entirely new way to work with 3D content. We call it Build 3D in 3D. Now, this is possible because holograms behave just like real-world objects. OK, I'm going to get a few more pieces that I want for my project. Let's see. Go with this one first. Put that there. I think I'll get this dome piece. And I think I'm going to need a decoration for later. Put that there. OK, it's UFO time. Let's get this right on top. Oh, too low. Resize. Hollow Studio is simple. You have powerful tools make it easy for anyone to create 3D objects in just minutes. OK, let's get that bright yellow again. There we go for this piece. I like where you're going with this, Lorraine. Why don't we show them the magnet tool? OK. Magnet. Let's put it oh, right there. OK, I'll use that tool again to, for my decoration. I think I'm going to want a few of these. Copy. Maybe one over here. Oh, not way over there. Copy. Good. 
think one more would look nice. Right. Good. Glue touching. Rotate. What do you think, Alex? I'm getting a good uh, Area 51 vibe. I would totally fly that. Now, holograms are like print preview for 3D printing. Now, wouldn't it be amazing if we could take Lorraine's, Lorraine's creation and turn it into a real quadcopter? So we did. This is a 3D print we made earlier of Lorraine's creation and Lorraine's quadcopter. This was made entirely in Hollow Studio. What do you think, Lorraine? Shall we take it for a spin? Do it. <laughs> so much fun. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. I hope you enjoyed this glimpse of Hollow Studio, a fast and simple workshop for creating your very own holograms. By now, you might be wondering, where has all this creation, where has all this experimentation been taking place? We've worked on this program for years. And as you heard earlier today, we're not exactly known for having a good track record for keeping secrets. Ironically, our Windows holographic laboratories are located directly below this room. We've been hiding in plain sight out of all places in the Microsoft Visitor Center. In this top secret space, only a select group of visionaries, leading scientists, and creators have worked. In that very secret space, we've had the great honor to partner with one of the most innovative organizations in history, an organization that's accustomed to reaching for the stars. An organization that literally takes on moonshots. So let me leave you with a sneak peek at how holographic computing enabled by Windows 10 will fundamentally change how they think about exploration, discovery, and collaboration. Thank you very much. OnSite is a tool that we're building in collaboration with Microsoft to connect scientists and engineers with the environment of the Curiosity Mars rover. Since we can't put our scientists yet physically on Mars, a technology like this allows us to investigate well, what's possible if we can make them virtually present. This was the first time where I could basically do a 360 and see Mars all around me. I love the fact that people, when they first encounter this project, have a feeling of, wow, you know, I've lived to see this. Instead of looking at 2D images, they can now walk around and explore Mars in their office. It was part inspiring and part just like, wow, I can finally do this thing that I really want to do. I could see using this every single day. It is a different way of exploring. That's transformation. Our plan is to deploy on-site to mission operations this summer and to be controlling rovers on Mars with this technology in July. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Satya Nadella. What an incredible moment. It's just amazing, technology. These are the kind of magical moments that we live for. Our industry's progress is punctuated by moments of category creation. Windows 10 and holographic computing is one such moment. What you just saw in terms of the experiences, many of you in the room here are going to experience more this afternoon. You're going to play Minecraft. You're going to be able to see Skype in a completely new way. They're just going to be mind-blowing experiences. Today is a big day, big day for Windows, a big day for what it means to our customers, to our partners, and to Microsoft. It is about Windows and our innovation going forward. It is about new categories new experiences, 
and most of all about new opportunities. It is also about our ambition and aspiration for Windows and its impact on the world. The fact that there are 1.5 billion users of Windows is incredible and humbling. It's a responsibility that none of us at Microsoft take lightly. But we have bigger hopes, higher aspirations for Windows. We want to move from people needing Windows to choosing Windows to loving Windows. That is our bold goal with Windows. I've talked in the past about Microsoft's mission being centered around empowering every individual and organization on the planet to be able to do more and achieve more. I've also talked about how we're going to go after that mission by focusing on things that we as a company can uniquely do and contribute, being the platform and productivity company in a mobile-first, cloud-first world, by doing excellent and world-class work when it comes to gaming experiences. Those are the strategies that are going to help us realize our mission. And Windows 10 is core to all of that, is central to all of that. Windows 10 is built for a world where everything, or nearly everything, both at home and at work, is digitally mediated where you want to be able to interact with your computing environment in the most natural of ways, from speech to touch to ink, and now, of course, gaze and holographic output. Windows 10 is built for a world where there are going to be more devices on the planet than people. That means the mobility of the experience is what matters, not the mobility of the device. Windows 10 is built for a world where not only are you consuming lots of data and content, but you're generating lots of data about yourself, about your environment, and you want to be able to reason over all of that in a trusted way so that you can enhance the very experiences across devices. Windows 10 ushers in an era of more personal computing in a mobile-first, cloud-first world. You saw the experiences throughout the day. It's not just a checklist of features. It's that design sensibility that allows us to put the more personal into computing and build things that center around you. You see that in the way we have approached Cortana and how it knows you on all your devices and helps you proactively. How our Spartan browser will enable you to browse the web and annotate the web and share the web. How the Surface Hub takes something like joining a meeting and makes it easy and really brings the power of the team together in a meeting. The first time I had a chance to see HoloLens and experience what a NASA scientist can do in terms of moving the rover and then being able to walk on to Mars was nothing short of surreal. These are the experiences that make Windows 10 that more personal computing environment that people are going to love. I want to talk about three specific strategy points around Windows. First, I want to talk about Windows as a service. I want to talk about Windows and mobility, because that I know is top of mind for many of you. And I want to talk about how does Windows and our cross-platform strategies come together. When it comes to Windows as a service, it's a pretty profound change. It's not just the simple mechanics although they are big changes in terms of our development methodology, our deployment policies, or servicing. It's much more fundamental than that. For us, it is about aligning our goals of success for Windows with customers and their experience and engagement with Windows. That's what Windows as a service means. 
For customers, they're going to get continuous stream of innovation. Not only continuous stream of innovation, but also the assurance that their Windows devices are secure and trusted. For developers, it creates the broadest opportunity to target. For our partners, hardware and silicon partners, they can coincident with our software innovation, drive hardware innovation. And lastly, for Microsoft, as I said, it allows us to think of success, measure our success and our progress in a way that is aligned with customers and their engagement. We want people to love Windows on a daily basis. Let's talk about Windows and mobility. Throughout today, you saw an explicit focus on mobility of experiences. That's our worldview. In the full arc of time, when we talk about mobility, it is not about the mobility of any single device, but it is the mobility of the experiences across devices. That is what we are focused on. We are building into Windows the experiences from productivity to gaming, how Spartan and the browser comes together, how Xbox Live comes together to enable that seamless crossover across devices as you move around at home and at work. We also have unified our developer platform. The universal application platform is what now runs across the phone, the PC, and the TV. And of course, now new categories such as holographic. And the fact that we've unified the application platform means developers can write applications that can target the widest set of Windows devices. We have a unified store that means creates a unified way for you to monetize as a developer. And we believe that's what's going to make us attractive for developers to write universal applications. And lastly, we absolutely are committed to bringing a great lineup of hardware. You saw some of the hardware innovation that's driving and stimulating demand with our Surface Hub and what we are doing with HoloLens. And you can be assured that we will do some fantastic work from the flagship phone to the affordable smartphone and have a full lineup of phones that will be available with Windows 10. Let me talk a little bit about our cross-platform approach. Simply put, Windows is the best place. It's the home for the very best Microsoft experiences. We are going to have services everywhere. But when it comes to Windows, we are not bolting on apps. We are seamlessly harmonizing our experiences. The way Cortana is built in, the way Microsoft Account and Azure Active Directory from an ID perspective are built into Windows. How OneDrive and the Sync Framework are built in, how Skype and Outlook are built in, how Xbox Live is built in. This is just built as part of Windows as a native experience where the scaffolding of the shell as well as the applications come together in the most seamless, delightful, personal ways for users. That's what we are doing with Windows. We absolutely are going to have our services and their application endpoints everywhere. But we absolutely believe that Windows is home for the very best of Microsoft experiences. There's nothing subtle about this strategy. It's a practical approach, which is customer first. We want to give ourselves the best opportunity to serve our customers everywhere and give ourselves the best chance of helping customers find Windows as their home. That's what we plan to do. Let me close out by talking about my own personal experience of Windows. Windows is, touches all of us. 
at work and at home. And for us who are perhaps close to this, each day we're reminded of the enormity of the responsibility that we have as we move the innovation of Windows forward. And to me, over the last year, there was this opportunity I had to go visit a school in the Bronx and see how the students there are using PCs to open up a completely new world for themselves, exploring, making things, learning to code. This summer, I was in an ICU room with my son as he was recovering from a surgery. And I saw all of these Windows embedded devices and Windows PCs and tablets being used by the nursing staff and the doctors to take care of him. There cannot be anything more personal than that. Over the holidays, I had a chance to see an 11-year-old girl unbox a Lumia 535, which was their very first computing device for the family and get ourselves set up on Microsoft account and all of these services and download Candy Crush and Skype and teach her parents about what it means to use those things. And this was in India. And that experience, that delight in that little girl's eyes left an undeniable impression on me. Those are the moments of true inspiration for me, and I know that that's what everyone feels, what you saw from Terry to Joe, Phil, Hyatt, Alex, and everyone else. That's the passion that drives us. Windows, unlike any other product at Microsoft, does bring all teams together to build Windows. And so we are really looking forward to how our Windows insiders use the new builds of Windows, the new flights of Windows, and the feedback from that is very important. This is one of the most collaborative releases of Windows, and we're looking forward to that feedback cycle. We want to make Windows 10 the most loved release of Windows. Thank you very, very much. Let me have Terry Meyerson come back on stage. Thank you. Today, we expanded our device family. We showed you some incredible new Windows experiences, and we shared our aspiration to upgrade every Windows device to Windows 10. For those of you here with us this afternoon, you're going to get to see Windows 10 close up on phones, PCs, tablets, the Internet of Things, Xbox, and you're going to be some of the first ever to experience Hollow Minecraft, Hollow Studio, and NASA's application to help their scientists walk on Mars. In the next few months, we're going to shift our focus to focusing on our hardware and software partners that are building great applications and devices with Windows 10. We have our Game Developers Conference. We have Mobile World Congress in Spain. We have WinHack in China. This all culminates at our Microsoft Build Conference in April, where we will be discussing innovation across the entire Windows 10 platform, including holograms and how Windows as a Service makes Windows 10 the best Windows development platform ever. This is a conference you're not going to want to miss. And then later this year, we will launch Windows 10, connecting with our customers through Windows as a Service. And there'll be some great new hardware from Microsoft and our hardware partners, including, yes, flagship Windows phones. I think you'd all agree, today really is a milestone in the history of Windows. I'm proud of the work the team has done. Windows 10 will forge a new relationship between us and our customers, consumers, developers, and the enterprise. Windows 10.
by democratizing technology, not putting it on a pedestal, by respecting everyone's privacy and encouraging their individuality. But we're not building another new operating system. We're building a deeply personal and incredibly empowering experience called Windows. Windows will be a natural evolution from innovations like Connect and Cortana. It will be built from the ground up, embracing the things that make us human. It will power the tools that people use every day. Everything from PCs to ATMs, tablets to subways, phones to ultrasound machines. It will be energetic and alive, just like the people it's built for. It will enhance their whole world, not just their digital life. And it will give them a voice then learn from and act on it. Windows will always be for people who do. Because people who do are the ones who move the world forward.